Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tani J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tani J. Laird. In this video, we'll be investigating structural uh, static determinacy and uh, structural stability in the context of both single rigid bodies and of simple frameworks made of multiple rigid bodies. We'll be looking at uh, how to determine mathematically based on the number of reactions and uh, when we get to frames, we'll be looking at uh, force releases as well, force and moment releases. Uh, but we'll be looking at how to determine mathematically uh, whether a frame, given frame or single object is statically determinate and then stable and un or unstable, and we'll be defining each of those terms. So the topic for today is determinacy and stability. So today we are looking at determinacy and stability. So these are both uh, these are both uh, concepts that come out of basic structural engineering and come out of elementary statics. Uh, you can learn about them a bit in statics, but we'll be taking them to uh, a bit beyond where you would have looked at in an elementary statics course. So let's just define these things. Determinacy. I will say a system is determinate. There's many ways you could define these, but there's many, way, many ways we could define these terms, but uh, I'll give a couple simple definitions. I could say a system is statically determinate uh, if all unknowns can be found using the laws of statics alone. So in other words, if I have a rigid body and I have a few reactions on it, something like this, maybe a pin support here, a roller support here, um, when I apply the laws of equilibrium, and I'm, I'm going to work primarily, the equations I'm going to use today are primarily the uh, two-dimensional case of equilibrium, but by applying the equations of equilibrium, and the two-dimensional ones would be the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to zero, the sum of forces in the y direction is equal to zero, and the sum of moments uh, counterclockwise positive is equal to zero. When I apply these, I can solve, let's say this was like a y uh, that would be AX and BY. And let's say it performed uh, by applying the uh, summation of equations, uh, uh, the summation of forces and moments, I can then get my unknowns, which in this case would be AX, AY, and BY. And in turn, once you know the reactions, you can often find other things. You can find, once you know for a, for, uh, for a given member, a straight cro a constant cross-section member, for example, once you know the end forces, you can the, the reactions and the end forces, you can find things like internal forces, joint forces, etc. So determinacy means we can solve for them using the laws of statics alone. And we'll be discussing this in greater detail. And then I want to look at stability. What does stability mean? Uh, stability can mean many things, but but in the structural context, is a, it has a specific definition. A structure is stable if it can resist arbitrary loading or an arbitrary set of loads. And we need to discuss what that means. See, stability, unstable, is unequal to collapsing. Just because a structure is unstable doesn't mean it's collapsing. So let's look at an example, a couple examples of unstable structures. So let's look at, for, first of all, we could look at the uh, flagpole case, the uh, 
pinned flagpole case. Let's say I have a pin, a pin joint on the ground. And then I have just a, a single member. So member AB, it's just free floating at the, it's just free at the top. Uh, there is no, um, there are no, uh, there's no p fixed pin or roller connection at the top. It is simply a pin support and then a straight vertical uh, member here. So basically what I have is this kind of thing here, which I am not very good at apparently. Oh, oh, okay, no, no, <laughs> okay. That's neither here nor there, but okay. Let's think about this structure. Uh, is it completely incapable of resisting load? No. It is capable of resisting some load. It's just capable, it is just very limited in the types of loads that it can resist. So if I apply a force, I don't know, something like, uh, let's say I apply a five kip force here or a five kip force here, that structure will be capable of resisting that load easily. I mean, depending on the strength of it, but again, um, Back, going back, uh, backing up a bit, when I'm talking about de determinacy and stability here, we're not talking about whether the, the, we're not talking about whether the structure has the physical strength or ability to, or, or you know, ultimate stress, yield stress, etc., to actually resist these loads. We're just determining this from a geometric and structure, uh, structural frame perspective. So something could be perfectly stable and determinate, but if its members are made of, you know, silly putty, it would still fall apart. But uh, we are talking about uh, just treating these objects as rigid bodies and investigating whether a frame, uh, investigating the properties and behavior of a frame, uh, treating each element as rigid bodies. So we're ignoring any kind of, right now we're ignoring any kind of deformation. We're ignoring any kind of flex, twist, bend, etc. Okay, so looking back at this column, uh, as long as I apply only vertical loads to this column, it is perfectly fine. So a vertical force, a horizontal force, we're good. However, what happens if I put a moment on it? Or what happens if I put a horizontal force on it at the, uh, at the, upper, uh, at the upper joint, joint B? Well, that's not going to work. The thing's going to flop over. And if I apply a moment to it, that's also going to make it flop over. So I would call this structure unstable. It doesn't mean, it, it's not going to actually collapse until a horizontal load or a moment comes along to make it fall over, but just uh, intrinsically as a property of this structure, it is not capable of resisting. It, has, it does not have the capability of resisting uh, loads from arbitrary directions. A stable structure would be something more like this. Let's look at the same flagpole case. And... Let's say I applied, I, I, let's say I, I uh, use the same base, but at the top, I put a roller there. Now the structure is stable. I can apply loads or moments at any direction or at any location. Whatever I want to do, this structure will not move. Um, it may deform if we get past the rigid body, if we abandon the rigid body assumption, but if we treat this as a rigid body, um, if we treat this as a rigid body, the uh, f this member, this frame itself, will not deform, will not move, etc. So, stability refers to again, a structure is stable if it if it can resist uh, an arbitrary set of loads, and uh, stability here can perhaps be seen as uh, if rigid bodies. Maybe that's a caveat we could put on that. So, a, uh -huh. ah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so here's a here's the question. Uh, how is it stay? So this uh, we got a question. This beam, this uh column here, or this frame here. How is the structure stable if we could just push it away from the wall? Now this one that that does actually get a bit tricky. Um. Realize when we model a roller support like this or like this, uh, yes, truthfully, you could, if, if you actually built something like this, 
uh, you it would only be able to resist forces. It would only be able to apply an upward force to the frame. Uh, and it's an upward. It would be an upward force because if you tried to force this thing downward, it would it would produce an upward reaction. If, so if you actually tried to produce this roller roller skate type support, that would happen. However, when we uh, we use these as models for uh, for positive and negative roller supports, so if you want to if you wanted to draw these more accurately, in, in if you wanted to more accurately model what we actually uh, consider with these, you'd probably have to draw something. Oh, I don't know, something kind of like maybe if you do something like this with like a little roller skate, maybe it's like in some sort of channel, so it can't. So it can slide back and forth, but it can't move up and down. If you wanted to do that, if you wanted to model this more precisely or more realistically, you could model it like that, where it's kind of a roller skate in a channel. But typically when we, in structural en engineering context, structural analysis context, when we draw something like this, this roller skate or this roller support, what we really mean is that it is capable of resisting both upward and downward load. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, so we now know what stability and determinacy are. Determinacy, again, means that you have, um, that you are able to solve for all your unknowns, typically reactions, using only the laws of statics. In other words, your number of unknowns is less than or equal to your number of equations. Because if we remember back to basic uh, linear algebra or to basic algebra, uh, the number of equations you need is has to be uh, greater than or equal to your number of unknowns if you want to find all of your unknowns. So if your number of unknowns is uh, less than your number of equations, then you're not going, or is greater than your number of equations, then you are not going to be able to solve for all of your unknowns. Okay. So now I want to look at this. Uh, next, I want to consider both single rigid bodies and then frames made of multiple rigid bodies and how we can determine whether these are uh, statically determinate or indeterminate and stable or unstable. So we're first going to look at individual uh, single bodies. And then after this, we're going to look at uh, frames made of multiple rigid bodies. So let's say you have a single, let's look at the single rigid body case first. And we're going to consider a single rigid body with R number of reactions. With R, reactions. So in other words, a uh, structure, let's look at some examples. We could have our potato body. And let's say we had a potato body with a pin and a pin. Two pin supports. If we had that, we would have one, two, three, four. Here, r equals 4. Or if we were looking at simple frames, we could have something like this. Let's say we had a beam and maybe something like this. Here, r would equal 3. Or we could have a beam with three roller supports. Oh, no, I guess I could mark those. Here's the reactions two on the pin and one on the roller. Uh, then I could have a beam that was say three rollers. And in that case, I would have three as well. 
So we need to define the number of reactions. We need to be clear what we're talking about when we say R. And a something with a, uh, let's say we had a roller and a cantilever, a, can or a fixed support on one side and a roller on the other. If we had this, we would have one, two, three, four. So here R would be equal to four. And based upon this, we can derive some, or we can uh, talk about some laws uh, related to this. Uh, basically, the, the number of reactions for a single rigid body will be all we need to determine whether a structure is determinate or stable. Again, we're looking right now just at a single rigid body, uh, a single object without any kind of moment releases or pins internal to it. So based upon R, we can determine whether something is stable unstable, determinate, or indeterminate. So first of all, let's say you have R, and I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna work through all these equations using um, uh, using a 2D system. These can also be derived for a three-dimensional system, but we're gonna be looking at 2D systems today. So let's say R is less than three. Here you have a determinant, but unstable system. So let's say you have a beam, for example, if you have a beam supported by two rollers. Well, um, let's think about this. Here you're going to have two reaction forces, one on the left, one on the right. And you could apply, and as long as you apply a vertical load to it, if you only apply a vertical load to it, you'll be fine. Uh, if you knew the dimensions, you could go and calculate those two reactions fairly simply, just using a balance of moments. However, the moment a horizontal load comes along, this thing is going to start rolling. It's just going to start rolling away, and uh, that's not good. You, you generally don't want your bridge doing that. Otherwise, somebody's going to uh, uh, somebody's going to roll up, uh, hitch this to the back of their truck, and haul it away and sell it by the pound. Anyway, don't want to get your bridge stolen. Believe it or not, that actually happens sometimes. Um, bridges have been stolen before. <laughs> anyway. And uh, so again, this will be determinant. We, ha we would have two unknowns, like an AY and a BY, and we'd have three equations of equi equilibrium. Sum of forces X, sum of forces Y, and sum of moments. And with three equations and two unknowns, you can very readily solve for uh, the reactions. However, um, you do not have sufficient reactions to fully restrain uh, this frame, so it will be unstable. The moment you try to apply a horizontal force, then it's going to start to move, which is not what we want in structures, generally. Then let's say we have r equals 3. So that's so that's our r equals, uh, r is less than 3 case. If r is equal to 3, then we have a system that is determinate and stable. Generally, although there's some exceptions we'll look at. Uh, determinate and stable. So this would a case of this would be something like a simply supported beam or like a fixed beam or a simply supported beam. In each of these cases, r equals three, and r equals three. So these have just uh, these have just enough reactions to be able to fully solve for all of the reactions using sum of forces x, sum of forces y, and balance of moments or sum of moments, setting all equal to zero, of course. Um, and they have enough reactions to fully restrain uh, the frame. And then there is some, now the, the, we'll look at some exceptions to, the, to this generally. Um, and then we have R is greater than three. And this is still stable, but it's indeterminate. So let's say you had something like a pinned pinned beam. 
It's supported by two pins, one on either end. Here, my number of reaction forces is equal to four. Or let's say I had a fixed fixed beam. Here, my number of reactions would be equal to six. Now, each of these would certainly be stable. They would be capable of resisting uh, forces in any direction. Again, when we say capable of resisting forces, we don't mean necessarily that they can, they have enough strength and stiffness to actually resist those loads to an acceptable degree, but we mean just ignoring the materials from a purely, ignoring the materials and the cross-section properties, looking pure, purely at the frame geometry, the frame itself has, a, has a properties necessary that if the materials are, are sufficient, the frame will be capable of resisting loads in any direction. Something like this, however, I don't care if this beam is made of unobtainium. I don't care if this is made of adamantium. I don't care if this is made of, I don't know, neutronium or something. This beam can be made of the most strongest material in the universe. If it's not properly nailed down, it's going to be able to move. It is unstable. Regardless of what it's made of or what the cross section of the beam is, a frame like this is unstable. So we'll say generally for single rigid bodies that if R equals to three, that we have a stable and determinate system. But there is one exception to that, and that's looking at geometric instability. So we need to consider geometric instability. And geometric instability, what this means is, uh, with geometric instability, you have enough uh, reactions. It's sort of the case of you have enough reactions, you're just doing it wrong. <laughs> or you have enough reactions, you're just not using them in such a way as to ensure stability. And this occurs through two ways, so we'll see. So we'll consider, let's now consider geometric instability. So we're not talking about, we're not talking about instability that comes from the number of reactions, but from how the reactions are geometrically oriented. For a single rigid body, uh, for a single rigid body, this occurs uh, when all reactions are either are either, and it can be either or, A, concurrent, slash intersecting. And when I say this, I'm ref when I say parallel or concurrent slash intersecting, I'm referring to their lines of action, or B, parallel. So let's look at this graphically. So it is possible to have three reactions, but still be unstable. For example, consider the case of a triple roller beam. Let's figure out the number of reactions I have. Well, I have three roller supports, and this beam is continuous all the way through. So I have one, two, three reactions. R is equal to three. However, this thing is clearly unstable. If I come along and, and if I try to, now if I try to uh, apply a vertical force to this, I'm golden. I can apply a vertical force and I'll have plenty of places for that load to go. But the moment I come along and try to apply a horizontal force, this thing's gonna be moving and my bridge is going to end up stolen, which is not good. Well, depending on your perspective, I suppose. Um, but so yeah, even though we have three reactions, this frame is unstable. It, it is not unstable by uh, merit of its number of reactions. It is unstable by ge the geometry of its reactions. So here we have reactions that are parallel, but the same can concur that the same can occur if the lines of action all intercept or all intersect at a single point. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the case of intersecting. Uh, of intersecting lines of action.
So let's take a look at intersecting lines of action and how we can get geometric stab instability that way. Oh, let me think. Let's see. So we want to have a system where, let's say you have something, and this, is be, this would be an unusual frame, but we're still dealing with a single rigid body. This is one piece. It can't bend or flex about itself. But let's say we have something kind of unusual like this. Let's say I have a roller here. Oh, then let's put a roller here. And then we'll put a roller here. And let's call these points A, B, and C. This frame is unstable. It may not, it's kind of counterintuitive, not counterintuitive, it can, it can be difficult to see at first, but I can prove it. So first of all, let's show the reactions. Let's label some reactions. This would be AX, we'd have a BY, and a CY. Actually, I'll go ahead and just, I like to label all my reactions upwards, so I'll do that. So CY, like shown, as shown, CY. Now, at first, like I said, this appears sort of stable, because if I do a, it's not like this case, I mean, this is pretty obvious that it's unstable. If I apply a horizontal force, there is absolutely nothing to resist that force. It's just going to keep on rolling. But, and, but here, though, look, if I, let's say I apply a horizontal force, I, I don't know, let's just say this is Fx, and let's say I apply a force, I'll just, I'll just look at the x force right now. Let's call this... Oh, let's call these dimensions A, and then maybe I'll have B over 2 and B over 2. So B over 2 uh, from, so it's halfway up, B over 2 from B to the, the applied horizontal force, etc. If I do a sum of forces in the horizontal direction, I think I'm golden. I have Fx applied, I have plus Ax, this equal to 0, and I can solve for Ax, and it'll be fine. We can just get that Ax is equal to the opposite of Fx very easily. And again, Fx here would be an applied force. And let's say I also had an applied y force. I can do that as well, I suppose, Fy. If I do a sum of forces in the y direction, well, I would have Fy. Uh, then I would have plus Cy plus By equals zero. And I have plenty of space, plenty of space to find some reactions that will hold that in equilibrium. However, Let's take a look at let's take a look at the real Achilles heel of this. What if I sum moments about B? Let's say I sum moments about B. Let's look at the lines of action of these of these forces, of the uh, of the restraints specifically, the restraining forces. So AX has a line of action like this. CY has a line of action like this, and BY sh shares the same line of action. In other words, oh, and FY does too, did also shares that line of action, but uh, that's that's fine. So if I sum moments about B, I end up with FX, the applied X force, times the moment arm length of B over two. And to be consistent, I, should push, I suppose I should put a negative on it because it's in the negative direction because it's a clockwise moment. And all of this has to equal zero because we're dealing with static equilibrium. Well, notice what I have here. I have an equation that ultimately cannot be solved. Uh, you need to have one in any equation that you can write, whether it's a, it, for, in order for a frame to be stable, in any equation you can write, whether there be a balance of forces in the X, balance of forces in the Y, or a balance of moments, there has to be some reaction present in that equation Otherwise, there's nothing to resist this Fx. So if I apply a force Fx here, I can see that if I take moments about this point, there is the Fx will uh, generate a moment, but there will, but none of the reaction forces will be able to resist that moment. So this thing will just want to rotate about this point here. So remember, if something is to be in static equilibrium, it must be in equilibrium about all points. I should be able to take balance of moments here or at A or at C or on the surface of the moon. It doesn't matter. If something is in equilibrium, it is in equilibrium about every point in existence. 
So you could, uh, now I don't know why, I don't know why you would take balance of moments about the surface, some points on the surface of the moon, but theoretically you could if you were really good at trigonometry. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, and to see also, uh, that's one interpretation. You can look at and uh, interpret uh, when, so you can interpret this two ways. One, you could interpret this as I have a, a, a force component and therefore a moment with nothing to resist it. Or another way you could look at it, this is from a more mathematical approach. This equation uh, cannot be true. Assuming B doesn't have, assuming B isn't, so fx times B over 2 equals 0. The only way this equation is true is if fx is 0 or b over 2 is 0. Therefore, if b is equal to 0. If b is equal to 0, then I don't really have the geometry that I claim to have, so it's kind of a trivial case. And if fx is 0, it doesn't really exist. If fx or b are any, uh, if, if uh, either f, or I should say, if both fx and b are non-zero, or in other words, are uh, representative of what I'm actually trying to represent in this diagram, then this structure will be unstable. Even if I have just a one pound load times, I don't know, 10 foot or something over two, well, that equation clearly has no solution. I have no way of making the structure stable because again, this is the case of concurrent reactions. So if all of my reactions have lines of action that point directly to one location, then regardless of what the, uh, uh, oh, and uh, maybe as a reminder, I can say, if I do my whole, uh, if I do my whole uh, equation to determine uh, stability and determinacy, well, I have R equals three, one, two, three. So I would predict based on the equations we looked at earlier that this was stable and, and determinate. It still is determinate, However, because all of the equa all of the lines of action intersect at a single point, then this is a, a geometrically unstable frame. So this is geometrically unstable because of current reactions, uh, because of concurrent reactions. This is uh, geometrically unstable because of parallel reaction, parallel reactions. This is geometrically unstable because of parallel reactions. So again, uh, for a single rigid body, uh, if you have, uh, generally, if you follow the equations we looked at previously, the inequalities, if R is less than 3, you'll have uh, uh, unstable but determinate. R is equal to 3, you'll have stable and determinate. And if R is greater than 3, you'll have indeterminate but stable. The one exception to this is if you have geometric instability, and this geometric instability comes from either all, uh, parallel reaction forces or from concurrent reaction forces. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so we'll go ahead and clean off the board a bit. And then uh, next we're going to look at uh, systems made of multiple rigid bodies. So that's all well and good if you just have a single object, but most frames are made of multiple objects. So we need to figure out how to extend these equations to more realistic frames if we want to do actual structural analysis rather than just uh, looking at very simple things such as a single beam, a single continuous beam. So, and that's what we'll start to look at next. All right, so now let's look at frames or objects made of multiple uh, component rigid bodies. Uh, frames of multiple rigid bodies. So 
So let's think about the forces that a joint between two frame elements can, um, uh, can transfer. Let's think about the type of uh, forces that a joint can transfer. By default, if two members intersect and are joined rigidly together, they can transfer by default, if they're just rich, if, if you have two frame elements that are joined together, this joint here is capable of transferring a uh, force in the X direction, force in the Y direction, and a moment. In other words, if I hold onto this piece and pull it to the left, it will be capable of resisting a horizontal force. If I try to pull it up, it will be capable of just that joint will be capable of transferring that vertical force. If I try to twist this beam, I'm holding this one here, that joint will be capable of transferring that force. So, um, but that not be that need not be the way we actually design structures. There is the concept of a release. So, for example, a moment release. Moment releases are probably the most common. And a, a release is a type of internal joint that, uh, well, as the name implies, it doesn't transfer all of the forces through the joint. It doesn't transfer uh, among FX, FY, and moment. One or more of those, the, the joint is constructed in such a way to not allow the full transfer of all three of those forces through the joint. So for example, let's say you have a pin joining two rigid members. If I try to apply a force in the X direction, that will be able to transfer through. If I hold onto this end and pull to the right, that will be able to transfer that force through. That joint, that pin joint will be capable of doing that. If I try to do a summation of forces in the Y direction, same thing. If I try to pull this one up, this one will be able to restrain it. So summation of forces in the Y direction, or just, I should just say forces in the Y direction. Sorry about that. Let me be consistent here. If I just do forces in, so it can, so it can transfer forces in the X direction, and it can also. Oh my God, I'm so used to draw. I am so used to draw, writing the summation of forces that when I just want to write forces by itself, my hand automatically writes the sigma sign. Oh boy, it's Monday. So Fy, if I try to transfer a vertical force through this, that will be possible. It will be capable of transferring that vertical force through that joint. No problem. However, the moment, the instant I try to transfer a moment through that joint, it won't be able to. It will not be able to transfer a moment through that joint. If I try to, if I try to bend this piece this way while holding this one steady, um, that's just going to rotate. It's, it is not, this joint is not capable of transferring moment through it. As such, we refer to it as a moment release. It releases moment between uh, two joints. Between, at the joint, it really at it, it is a joint that releases end moments between two uh, members. Uh, you could also have uh, roller joints. Roller joints slash, or you could call these uh, uh, force uh, releases. So let's say you had something like this. Let's say you have one member coming in here and then a roller and another member here. Well, if I try to apply a force in the X direction, that's no bueno, that's not gonna work. If I pull this one to the left uh, and I hold onto this one on the right, it's just gonna keep on moving. There's not, that joint is not gonna be able to, is not going to be capable of resisting that horizontal force. Uh, forces in the Y direction, yeah, that I'm, I, I am actually good there. If I hold onto this one and try to pull this one down, that vertical force will transfer through that joint. Again, we draw it as a simple circle, a simple roller, but realize these are usually capable of resisting forces into, in uh, both positive and negative direction. And if I try to apply a moment through that joint, that won't work either. I'll get the same kind of thing I got with the pin joint. If I try to rotate this, that's not gonna, if I try to hold this one and try to twist this, this thing is just going to rotate freely. 
it's not going this joint is not capable of transferring a uh, moment through it so that would release force or moment and you can have theoretically you can have any combination of these so in order to um in order to look at the equations of stability and, determ and determinacy here, I'm going to define a variable C. Uh, let's see, capital C be the number of releases or of, uh, of I, I would say degrees of freedom, but uh, I don't wanna get too technical right now, I'll just say, uh, let's see be the number of forces released um, internally, maybe internally, in a frame. So if you have a, so let's say for every, uh, for every fixed joint, you're not going to add any, so you will equal to zero. For every, uh, for every pin joint, for every pin joint, we'll increase C by one. For every roller joint, for every roller joint, C will equal to two. And if you had a joint that really isn't a joint, like a, uh, let's say you had just something really weird like this where they're not even connecting, that would be a total force and moment release. So I suppose you could have C equals three there, but that's not really a joint at that point, just two members that happen to be close together. So if you literally just have, um, imagine taking the roller joint and removing the roller, you would have a C equals three. This joint is not capable of transferring any force or any moment through it, and it's not really a joint at all. So let's see what this looks like then mathematically. So let's see what this looks like mathematically in terms of determinacy and stability. Now, uh, these equations are gonna look very familiar because we just looked at these. These are sort of expanded versions uh, of the previous equations that worked for single rigid bodies, but expanding them to work with uh, multiple rigid bodies joined together in a frame. So instead of previously we had R is less than three, here we have R is less than three plus C. If R is less than three plus C, then we have a a uh, determinant but unstable structure. If R is equal to three, then we have a uh, determinant and stable. Oh, sorry, uh, three plus C here. A uh, determinant and stable. And if R is greater than three, plus C, of course. Then we have a, a system that is indeterminate but stable. Indeterminate but stable. So all of, if you're wondering where this comes from, all of this ultimately comes down to equations of equilibrium. All of this ultimately comes down to our equations of equilibrium. So let's see what I mean by this. So let's say I have a frame like this again. 
something like this. And I'm going to put a pin roll, a pin support on this side. Actually, that's a roller support, sorry about that. And then a pin support here. Um, actually, no, I think I'll actually make this a pin as well. Imagine I have two pins. So, um, my number of reaction forces, I have two pins, so R is four. Now, the problem again I have is that I have only three equations of equilibrium. So if I try to solve for all four reactions, I'm not going to be able to do that uh, without some uh, higher uh, structural analysis techniques. But if I try, so again, I don't have enough information right now to solve for those. Now, I might be tempted to cut this and say, well, what if I divide this into two pieces? Then I'll have two objects. Can I not just do a summation of, e of forces, um, balance of equilibrium on each of them? Can I not do that? I can do it for each piece. I could then do a sum of forces x, a sum of forces y, and a sum of moments. And the same thing here. And the thing is, yes, I can. And breaking this frame into two, into two sub pieces, two rigid bodies, breaking this big rigid body into two smaller rigid bodies does in fact give me three more equations of equilibrium. However, it produces a problem. And that's that when I cut this, I've revealed three more unknown forces. So ultimately cutting a rigid body into smaller rigid bodies um, without any kind of release present doesn't really get you anything in terms of static, uh, um, static determinacy. Because yes, when you cut a rigid body into two smaller rigid bodies, you do gain more equations of equilibrium, but you also in turn create more unknowns. So if I create three unknowns to, to get three equations, I haven't really accomplished anything if my goal is to solve for unknown forces. That's not gonna work. However, what if I go and use a release? Let's see what happens when I use a release. When I use a release, especially a moment release in this case, things change. So let's say I have an internal pin to this, like so. And the same, uh, the same kind of pin and pin supports, like so. Again, I will have four reactions. So R is still equal to four. But now I have C is equal to one because I'm releasing moment at one location. If I had two pins, my C would be equal to two. If I had three pins, my C would be equal to three, et cetera. It depends on the number of forces released. So now imagine that I cut this into, two, into its component parts. Now I'll have two reactions on each of these. Those unknowns still exist. But now, because this is a pin support or a pin joint, moment cannot transfer between the two pieces. Only X and Y force can. So I, had, I now have, and from each of these, I would still have my sum of forces X, sum of forces Y, sum of moments, and the same here. I'm about to draw a line here and here. I still have those for both cases. I break this into two bodies and I can and I can still do a balance of forces and moments on each of them. However, unlike the case of the fixed uh, fixed fixed connection or the fixed connection, I haven't produced three more unknowns. I've only produced two unknowns. And now I have four unknowns, or no, sorry, now I have two, four, six unknowns, and I have six equations of equilibrium sum of forces x, y, z on both pieces. So uh, normally if you're just dividing a rigid frame into pieces, it doesn't give you, any, it doesn't usually give you a benefit in terms of static determinacy, but for a frame with a pin or roller or, or other uh, force release or moment release inside it, when you break it up, uh, you can sort of get more bang for your buck. And you have a, um, yes, you may gain, three, you'll, you'll gain uh, two more unknowns, but you will also gain three equations of equilibrium. So, um, and we could look at a few more examples. If you're, another example would be something like this. Imagine you had a frame 
like this. So there is a, uh, there's two frames uh, and there's pins in the middle here and two pin supports. Um, so we have a column, a column, two beams, and then pin joints in the middle. My number of releases, my number, not specifically my number of releases, but my number of forces released is two. Because I re release moment twice on this one and this one. R is equal to four here. And so therefore, um, my number of reactions is, uh, my, and my number of reactions is four. And so if I then did a, uh, if I apply my previous equations, my R has to be, let, it, let's see, let's look at the relationship between R and, uh, R and C plus three. So I have two plus three or five, and this is less than. So this would be statically determinate, but unstable. Oh, uh, determinate and unstable. And we could look at some more examples as well. Uh, one break, one quick thing I will mention as we finish up. Uh, this is beyond. This is of more relevance than just theoretical uh, considerations. So, determinate structures are um, one of their properties is that they are determinate ultimately because there is one and only one way for load to travel through them. Uh, if you apply a load to one location, there is only one way that that load can find its way to the reactions or to the supports. So if it's indeterminate though, there are multiple paths load might take. And while giving it multiple paths does make it diff more difficult to solve for the reactions, because um, there's more than one path it can take and you can end up with an indeterminate system, while having, um, when you make something indeterminate, it gives it more paths. Um, but in addition to making a structure indeterminate, it also adds redundancy. If you have a statically determinate system it, or a statically determinate frame, if one element of that frame fails, the whole thing fails. There is no alternate path for load to, to shoulder, um, for the load to, to redistribute to. So determinate systems are easier to solve, but determinate structures by their nature have no redundancy. All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to leave questions or comments in the comments below. Uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, make the robots happy, and I will see you all again soon. Again, hope you found this uh, enjoyable or at least a little informative. Uh, regardless, hope to see you all again soon, and as always, thank you.